Lost Keys. Lost Keys. <laughs> he had lost his keys, and so he was out in his front yard on a sunny day looking for them once again. Couldn't find them anywhere, but he kept looking. And then a friend of his came walking down the street, and he said, what are you doing? Well, I'm looking for my keys. I can't find them. Oh, well, I'll help you out. And so the friend got down on his knees, and they searched throughout the yard. And after a while, the friend said, are you sure you think you lost him out here? Where's the last place you remember seeing him? And the friend said, oh, I didn't lose him out here. I lost him inside. <laughs> the friend said, well, why are we looking outside for your keys if they're inside? And he said, oh, well, there's so much more light out here. <laughs> Now, is that a groaner joke <laughs> or a long-told Indian story? Both. <laughs> it's both. It's a story that's been around a long time, taught in the Eastern Indian tradition, told a little bit differently about a lost needle. And it's a psychological tool. It's a story that has a lot more meaning than just the groan you gave it. Take a moment and think about that looking for the keys out here where there's all this light because I don't want to go inside. It's dark in there and I don't know that I'm going to find it and I'm going to stay out here in the light. It's called the street light effect. <laughs> the street light effect that we want to be where it's easy. We want to be where the light is shining. Who wouldn't? Even if that's not where the key is. You may not find the key out in the yard. Sometimes you have to leave the sunny place and you have to back up and you have to go into the darker space. You have to go where there are shadows and it's not easy, but there may be a really important set of keys for you in that place that you don't automatically go to. You see, it's not just a groaner joke. <laughs> Like so many important spiritual teachings, it's very simple on the surface, but deep down, it has a very deep message for us. Isn't that how Jesus taught us? He taught by simple parables about seeds and about coins, but he was telling us so much more. He was talking about the Christ that lives within us that we are busy looking for out here but we find in here. It's that same story of looking everywhere else and finding out that what we really need is deep inside us. So are we looking in the grass, in the light, or are we looking deep in the house within where it's a little dark sometimes? And as I was working on my sermon this week, and I named it Living Metaphysically, and I was ready to talk about a number of unity teachings. We have all these wonderful tools at our disposal. And as I was working on it, there was just one that kept coming back to me over and over again. And I found that while I wanted to play in the grass in the light, there was one key waiting for me in the dark that I really needed to talk about. And that is the teaching of meditation and the silence. Ooh. <laughs> Meditation and the silence. Yeah, we're going to go there. We're going to go into one of the areas that is a foundation of unity, and yet that I find many, many, if not most of us, struggle with on some level. That it is not the easiest thing in the world, even though it's one of the simplest things in the world. And so we have this love-hate relationship, and a lot of us live with unity guilt, that we're not good meditators. I know I'm supposed to, and I know we talk about it, and I've taken those classes, and I've read those books, but I'm not actually doing it. And then we feel guilt, and we feel shame, and we just don't talk about it, but we all kind of assume that we're all doing it. So let's clear the deck today. First of all, this is always, for me, a no guilt, no shame, no blame zone. Anytime we're talking about what's going on, and especially when we're taking a look at what might not be working in our life, 
First thing we have to do is say, no guilt, shame, blame, none of that. Let's just look with curiosity. So let's look with curiosity at how we're all doing with our meditation practice. Now, if you feel like you've got this, you have been meditating, you do it every day that you plan on, you meditate 20 minutes, 40, whatever it is, if your meditation practice is rock solid, let me see some hands. Got this. We have got two. All right. <laughs> Excellent. And isn't that fun? No guilt, no shame. Yay! I love that we have two. It means that what I'm going to talk about is what's something we need. Yay! Now, how many of you are in the middle? Yeah, I do it. I'm not where I'd like to be, but I've, I've, I've been coming along here. Okay? There's about a third of us, I'd say. And then how many of us, now this is still really a struggle. I don't have it. I don't do it. I'm going to be really honest here. Okay? How about that? Let me see. Hands. About the other, about half, half, and two is kind of where we are. There were a few more people in the middle. So thank you, first of all, for being so honest. Because you know what? For the first 20 years that I was in Unity, struggle. Absolutely struggled with this. I would have been really in the last category, but I would have told you I was in the middle category. Yeah. yeah. I was a little, I was ashamed to admit it to myself, let alone to other people as a good Unity student and someone who was taking classes. This was long before I decided to become a minister, but hey, I would have told you, and they're like, hey, does anyone here meditate? Oh, yeah, yeah, me. I meditate. I'm a meditator. <laughs> yeah. And then it was like, well, when's the last time you meditated? Oh, like two years ago. Yeah. But <laughs> I've got that. I'm a meditator. Yes. And that's really the truth, and it's hilarious, and it's so real. So to all of you that are in that boat, I just love you for it. It's absolutely a good place to be, because you're still here, which means that it's still on your radar, and you're coming, and you sit through that meditation, and, and maybe it's like the best part of your week. You're like, yes, at least when I go on Sunday, they're going to make me sit there and do my meditation. <laughs> Gosh darn, I get one that I can put the check box in. And that's okay. I know that you know that. And yet, it is such an important thing. And it breaks my heart a little bit. Every now and then, someone will tell me, I just don't need it. Or I just can't do it. So I've really given up. But I'm really fine. I, you know, I do all the other things. Affirmations and prayer and outreach. And, and maybe that's true. Maybe that really can be a legitimately deep spiritual path. But I don't think so. I think that this is one of those things that we must get to really heal our consciousness. It not must get or we're going to judge you or say that you're bad. But one thing that you need to get for yourself, for the deepening of your consciousness. And that is what our co-founders taught all about the silence for Charles and Myrtle. It's said that Charles spent several hours every day in his chair, in his office, just meditating, just sitting in the silence. I think that's how you get to be a Charles or a Myrtle Fillmore. When I think about Buddhist teachers, those that I'm, I have a friend, Bhante Vimala, and we've all read the stories of Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama, and most of them, they've been chosen before birth, you know? So they start out very young, spending hours, days, weeks, years, just meditating very deeply, which is why I think when we're with them, you just feel something. There is an energy to people that can devote their life to that. But the rest of us are what we like to call in Buddhism, mere householders. We are not gurus. We are not the Dalai Lama. We don't have, who here has the time for, you know, four hours of meditation every day? Anybody? Even the retired people are not raising their hands. <laughs> this just is not real. But five minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it might be is real. So the teaching is adjusted from what Jesus did and what the Buddha did. They know people aren't going to be able to do that. But there's a bridge for us. And Charles Fillmore says, be still and turn within to the great source. The source of what we need is within us. And he said over and over again, be still and know. Go within. 
in the silence is everything that we're looking for. When Myrtle Fillmore healed herself of tuberculosis, again, it is said that she, or she has said, she spent hours every day talking to her body. Anyone know her famous prayer that she used to heal herself? I am a child of God, therefore I do not inherit sickness. If you want a powerful healing affirmation to take into prayer with you, use the prayer from Myrtle Fillmore over 120 years ago that she used to heal her body over two years every day, hours at a time. I am a child of God and I do not inherit sickness. I am a child of God and I do not inherit sickness. That is the power of the source that is within us waiting to be tapped. It will come sometimes out of the yard and into the harder place. So today I'm, I'm challenging you a little with not just the easy part, not just the unity that lives in the grass in the sunlight, but the unity that lives in the house that's a little more difficult, that not everybody's going to take the detour for. Many of us are going to stay here in the grass, and that's fine. That's okay too, but I know that many of you are looking for that deeper experience, and it lives back in the house. There's a different set of keys back in the inner house that we turn to. And house is, is a great way to look at it because that's what Emily Cady, how she referred to it is, God bless you, she said, this is the secret place of the Most High. Ooh, secret, I want in. It's the secret place of the Most High, the silence, this place within you where we really connect. We are always connected. Make no mistake, we are always connected in God, as God, coming forth. And yet in the silence, there is this connection that we make. And so she called it, Emily Cady called it, the secret place of the Most High. And she said, Beloved, what you seek, you will not find in the mental or emotional realm. What you seek is not there. She says, what you seek will come from the deep silence within. That's where the answers are. Have I convinced you? Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's good for us, and we know that. And yet we struggle with it. There are barriers that get in the way. You know, the mindfulness movement is huge. If you are going through any kind of a treatment, they're going to offer you something with mindfulness. There are meditations and YouTube clips and everything about it. It's something that the scientific world knows is good for us, the psychological community knows, and the spiritual community has known for millennia. We have always known this is a key rock that unity was built on. But we struggle. So my question to you is, what gets in the way? What gets in the way of this thing that you know is good for you, that you come here and you believe in, but darn it, it's hard. What gets in the way? Anybody? Monkey mind. Monkey mind. Fear. Fear. Discipline. Discipline. Don't know if I'm doing it right. Don't know if I'm doing it right. There's a right way and a wrong way, apparently. And I want to be the good one. Our need to control. Our need to control. Mm, I'd have to give up some of that feeling of control. How in control are you, really? Anything else? Ruth, making time for it. Making time for it. Anybody busy? <laughs> the whole room? I haven't met anybody hardly that isn't talking about being busy these days. That's a word that I'm working on getting rid of in my vocabulary. <laughs> no, I am choosing to spend my time on exciting things. That's what I'm choosing to do. So time. Time is a great one. Let me start with time. How long should you meditate? Who? Anybody? How long are you supposed to meditate? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Anybody else? Everybody agree? 20 minutes you've heard? 20 minutes is good? Mm -hmm. B? No? Whatever. Whatever. Okay. Whatever time is good. Yeah. Probably heard all of that. So yes, tw many people talk about 20 minutes is a great thing to shoot for. And if we're not able to make 20 minutes, I say start with one. Right? Isn't that crazy? One minute. Really? That's not good enough. I wouldn't be a good meditator if I did that. Surely I should do it long. See the, the shoulds that come along here? I should. But what if 
one minute every day. Here's the math. Minister math, I like to call it. One minute, seven days a week, adds up to more than 60 minutes once a week. Did you do the math in your head really quick there? <laughs> seven minutes versus 60 minutes. Because it's about consistency and discipline. But discipline starts to shut me down, so I say, well, I can do, I can watch Breaking Bad for 60 minutes a day. I can sure spend one minute in meditation a day. And yet that ego that someone mentioned says, no, you can't. I'm going to take even that minute from you. And so for many years, I would wake up and I'd think, okay, I should do it before I go to work, but I'm running late, so I'll do it when I get home from work. And then when I got home from work, well, let me make dinner, and next thing you know, well, but I'm super tired. Let me just go to sleep, because I, I don't think I keep my eyes open. One minute, and then I'll get up and I'll do it first thing tomorrow morning again. And over and over and over again, I would do that. So I say, if one minute is too much, and it literally may be, Start with one second. The lowest bar I'm going to set for you, folks. <laughs> Do not ask for a lower bar. For one second. What if one second every day and see how you feel? See if there's <coughs> just enough for you when you get in your car after the day at the office, so you're not rushing to get to the office, you stop and you have a little post-it note on your steering wheel that says one second. One second I'm going to meditate. There, I did it. I mean, they're talking about the science of breaking habits and building habits. Start small, and then start even smaller, and then cut it in half again, and start there, and build the win. So one second of meditation a day is where I'm asking you to start. Another great thing to do for your meditation practice is come here on Tuesdays at 6 or 6.30? Six, 6. 6, thank you. At 6 o'clock, we have a meditation group here. And I tell you, when I joined a meditation sangha, things took off. Every week, I missed a lot, but every week, I, was, I tried to get there. And there is something about doing it with others, with a teacher. Anita is our teacher. I will be joining in from time to time, and I can tell you it's powerful. Something happens when you join together with others. And most of us find it easier. So do that. Another great way to do this is to start with guided meditations. Someone said to me after first service, yeah, but that's not the silence. Like, that's okay. Start with training the brain to getting used to sitting, quiet, presence. Even if someone is doing the talking for you, they're getting you into those beta waves that you want to get into. So use those tools if you need those. And then experiment as you can with letting it go. But find the ways that you can to introduce this back into your life or to re-energize your practice because it's worth it. You know, most people say, oh, I feel better when I do it. I notice a difference in my day. I'm less cranky. I'm more centered. You feel really great first thing in the morning when you do it. You know, that's why they tell you that you should make your bed every morning. Because you accomplish one thing and you shoot off chemicals in your brain that say, yay, you! <laughs> and then more of that. And then you meditate, yay, you! That is chemically what your brain is doing. It's like a Facebook hit. It's like someone liked, oh, yay, me! That's what's happening. <laughs> it's very deep. There's a lot more to it than that. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I play one on TV. I love knowing what's going on when these things happen. I know they work. Charles and Fillmore and Charles and Myrtle knew they worked, but they didn't have all these MRIs to tell them why. Now we know what's happening in this brain. And so your brain on meditation, one of the best places that you can be. And I know, again, that this is a key that lies in the house. It isn't necessarily out here that's easy. Another workshop is a great thing to do. Another book to read. I read every book there was on meditation, but I wasn't doing it. Because knowing and doing are two different things. And yet I found after especially the 10 year mark, believe it, 10 years, after a 10 year mark, there was something that deepened even then in my practice. 
It was wonderful all the time long, and I knew it, and I was into it. But something at the 10-year mark, I clicked into some kind of groove that has never left me. And I've talked with other teachers. Robert Brummett was my teacher at Unity Institute and Seminary, and a profound influence on my life. And I, I talked to him one time, and I said, boy, it's, it's, it's even different now at, at the 10-year mark. Is there really something to this? And he said, oh, yes. There is something to it happens. And my friend John Welshans also teaches meditation, said the same thing. Oh, there is a sweetness that goes beyond <coughs> even the surface that I knew was good. And it's exciting. And, and I don't even know where it goes from here. I don't know what 20 years solidly looks like. But it's just like yoga. The longer you practice, the more naturally it comes. And so keep at it. And the monkey mind is the biggest sign that you are right where you need to be. If the mind keeps going, great, just keep practicing. It's a little hard? Yeah, that's why the keys are in the house on this one. It doesn't come just like that, so persevere. Because you deserve this time in the silence. You deserve to work with your consciousness, to bring it a little more into alignment. Maybe not control, but the more you let it go, ironically, the more it will come back to you. And so, do what you will out in the yard. But when you're looking for the real keys, the real keys to go deeper, take some time out of the sun, into the silence, and find what you really, really crave. Namaste. And now is our time for our love offering, and as we are bringing out our substances, I wanted to take a couple of moments to talk about Reverend Richard Billings. Reverend Richard passed this week. And so at Unity Oak Park, they are celebrating his life during the service here today. So let's take a moment and, and send our love to that community, to Unity of Oak Park, where he served for many years. and. Many of you, I can tell, were, were touched by Reverend Richard, and so let's say a special prayer. For Reverend Richard, we hold you in our heart as you cross over into the great unknown. All that you taught for so many years, the assistance that you offer to churches like Fox Valley when I was there, to this church when you came in, to the churches you founded, for the workshops you led, the trips that you took, you were a monumental figure in unity, and we are grateful. I am grateful to follow in your footsteps. And our love and our hearts go out to Unity Oak Park, to Richard's friends and family. We offer them comfort and compassion in this time of loss, and we offer love and joyful celebration as Richard moves on into an even greater realm still feeling your presence, Richard. Thank you. We love you and we bless you on your way. And then with our love offerings in our hands, if you want to hold it to your heart, grateful to give into this community, let's say our love offering together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I give, and all that I receive. As we enter into this time of meditation, I invite you to gently close the outer eyes, become still, and as the breathing starts to slow down, notice it, allow it. Simply watch it come in and go out. And as I sit here in this chair, I notice how I am sitting. The back is straight, the shoulders relaxed.
open myself up to this present moment. Noticing this breath come and go. So simple. That's all I need to do. Be aware. Be present. This has been a sacred time for my soul and for every soul in this room. We have connected at a soul level, at a spiritual level. We are one with the one. And this energy is now magnified in each of us and we take this out into the world. Peaceful workplaces, peaceful relationships. The peace that comes from this time is now magnified and multiplied out into the world. And so it is.